sculpture, meaning that it moves. So the viewer is invited to engage its motion often, so it's interactive. I often involve the community in the making of the sculpture, sometimes in gathering materials to collect uh, plastic, for example, to make sculptures. So I, um, I engage the public to um, the community to gather materials for me, with me, and often create work alongside. And um, my work is often public as well. So it's um, free to see and available and accessible. So um, most recently, I'm focusing almost exclusively on recycled materials. So I have collections of materials in my studio just waiting to be used like bicycle inner tubes. I have a boxes and boxes of gloves. I have uh, croquet balls. I have uh, bags that once held coffee beans. So I collect mass quantities of interesting materials. So if, if you have mass quantities of one material, let's talk. So I'm working a lot with, with plastic these days, but I want to back up and talk to you about how it came to be that I'm working with recycled materials because I haven't always worked with recycled materials. So I'm 56 and when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s, uh, Woodsy the Owl was um, commonly advertised and public service. So I remember Give a Hoot, Don't Pollute and this campaign, Not to Litter. I also vividly remember the, uh, the crying Indian ads. As it turns out, this is an actor. He's actually not an Indian. He's Italian. But these made a real impression on me. And um, I have, I think, since my earliest memories, thought a lot about not littering and not, um, not being wasteful. So the earliest sculptures that I recall using recycled materials uh, was this interactive kinetic piece called ready-made color wheel. It's a bicycle wheel on a spoke that's mounted to the wall with door stopper springs and weighted balls, colored balls. The viewer spins it, engages its motion, and then the balls move back and forth and it perpetuates the motion. This piece was also created around that time and all of the wood parts uh, are constructed of new and raw materials, but the red balls that are the weights for this harmonograph, which is a contraption that moves on pendulums and draws on the paper in the center, are actually made out of bowling balls, which is resin. So I would go around to bowling, um, bowling centers and ask them if they had any bowling balls that they were willing to uh, give to me. And I started collecting bowling balls as my weights for this and other projects. Project. The, this uh, series that I want to show you next are hyperbolic forms. So hyperbolic, usually when we say something is hyperbolic, uh, we're meaning that it's exaggerated. But really what hyperbolic means in a scientific um, definition is to expand exponentially. So crocheting uh, a material is a way of making a hyperbolic surface, so a surface that ripples and folds. This can be seen with kale, with seaweed, um, with other forms in nature. So I replicated that by crocheting bicycle inner tubes that I cut into very skinny strips that are about the size of spaghetti. This is another piece that is a hyperbolic form and it waves and uh, folds much like uh, the, the other one. Also um, crocheted bicycle inner tubes. So I would go to bicycle shops and ask them if they had blown out bicycle inner tubes that they would be willing to give me. And then I take them home and shred them with this little pizza wheel that I invented that has many different blades, stretching it and then cutting it. 
this is a little bit of a closer up shot of the bicycle inner tube strips. Um, I had a show at Suffolk University where I was exhibiting these. So I really was up against a deadline and needed some help. So I recruited my mother who's, who crochets and my two aunts that crocheted. And uh, for a very long three or four day weekend, we crocheted like crazy. Um, and they helped me pull this show together. I do enjoy involving the community, um, but I also enjoy when people can touch the work and engage its motion and handle my work. So this, um, this cube is made up of balls that are wound with bicycle inner tube strips and springs. And when you tap it, it moves and jostles. Um, you can see, if you go to my YouTube page, you can see all of these sculptures in motion. This is another interactive kinetic sculpture. All of the lines that are horizontal and vertical are springs. So when you tap this piece, which is called quiver, it moves and it shakes. There's a, a closer up version of it here. So you can see again, um, like winding up a ball of yarn, it's wound with the uh, bicycle inner tube strips. This is a kinetic sculpture. It is not interactive. It has a motor that rotates a rod that is up, up above. So it turns the rod up, down, up, down. Because each of the balls has a different weight that I was able to gauge with more or less bicycle inner tube strips, um, and the motor turns at varying frequencies, uh, each ball finds its um, resonant frequency at different times. So the balls that are maybe still at one point have a higher up and down movement at another point. This was a collaboration that I, a collaborative project that I did with Rob Hart, who um, I met and worked with quite a bit when I was in the physics department at Harvard as an artist in residence. Clean ocean wave sculpture was much more of a deliberate and conscientious decision to work with trash. I was an artist in residence at the University of New England. And one of the professors who teaches marine pollution came to me and asked if I would do a collaborative project with her students who were going out to clean up beaches on International Coastal Cleanup Day. So I told the students what my project was going to be and asked them if they would uh, collect the ocean trash, the beach trash, and give it to me. My work study students and I also collected trash from local beaches near the UNE campus, which conveniently is right on the water. And then we collected data, how, my, how many chum bags, how many boots, how many CDs, uh, how many Bic lighters we found and collected all the information and then cleaned and shredded all of the materials. And then I installed a loom made of stainless steel wire in the Marine Science Center stairway that winds down in a, um, like a spiral. So you can see here that there are gloves and buoys and a broom handle and some bud light that got shredded. So everything got shredded into weavable strips. And then, um, it created this spiral that you could see overhead as you were passing from one floor to the next. My intention was for this to be an attractive piece, that it would be colorful and beautiful. And as you got closer to the piece and looked more carefully at what it was made of, you would then discover that it was made of trash. Another huge project that um, I worked on with students at the University of New England was an amphibious tiny house project. I have a fascinated fascination with tiny houses and I have an even bigger fascination with floating tiny houses. My husband and I sail and whenever we see a floating house in the mid coast area, I make it a point to row over, um, inspect, look, peek in the windows if I can, take photographs. So I already was 
very drawn to these floating tiny houses. So every um, Wednesday night, I would meet with a group of students who were also interested in tiny houses and we would brainstorm the ideal tiny house. And uh, we collectively decided that the tiny house should float and be on a trailer so that it could be parked, trailered, move, be in fresh water, be in ocean water uh, and be totally off the grid and efficient. Um, so we collectively designed this without any real intention of actually building it because I was only supposed to be at the University of New England for one semester when we got funding for the project. And the next step was building. So we were given a very large workshop in Portland and I started asking all my boat builder friends and people that had um, more experience with me uh, about fiberglass and engines and went to the Coast Guard and learned about all the regulations that our amphibious tiny house that was a boat would need to meet. And we spent a year building an amphibious tiny house and the students would drop in. I had hours, they could drop in any time. I would always have work for them. Um, they, many of them had never used drills or hammers or saws or um, any type of tools before, but they were all willing and eager and I managed to stay one step ahead of them um, because this was a huge learning curve for me as well. So uh, here's one of the students putting on bottom paint and here we have fiberglass pontoons. This was key in our amphibious tiny house floating. We learned about displacement here and um, buoyancy. And then um, everything was complete and this is where we started to uh, build the tiny house on to the top platform. So this, um, this whole pontoon system was 24 feet long and eight feet wide. And in the middle was a platform that was eight feet wide and 16 feet long, which is where we built the tiny house. Weight was really important here. Everything had to be built light so that it would be um, buoyant and float. So here's a team. Uh, this day we were erecting a wall and then putting on the uh, sh exterior sheathing. And here's a sketch of what our amphibious house would eventually look like and a photograph of our amphibious tiny house on its trailer. At the end of the year, we donated the, um, the project to the College of the Atlantic where they uh, use it to house guests of the, um, of the college faculty, parents, um, any visiting guests. So we had a composting toilet in it. The plan was for it to have solar panels. Uh, we had steerage and plans for there to be battery storage and propulsion. Uh, they, they actually decided to just leave it on a mooring with no propulsion and steerage, which makes it a lot easier. If you're interested in this project, there's an entire website that we devoted to it with photographs of the process and the materials and um, all of the steps that we uh, took along the way to build this project. Another project that uh, came about as a next step was a bring your own bag project that I did at the, Rock, uh, the Rockland Public Library. So towns were at this time going from um, plastic, single use plastic bags to reusable plastic uh, bags or bring your own bag. And I was uh, very active at that time going to city council meetings and advocating for a single, uh, to abolish the single use plastic and encourage people to use reusable bags. I wrote a grant for, through the Maine Arts Commission, which I received to purchase 300 really high quality nylon bags. And when they arrived, they were in these potato like shapes and I unfolded them into these brightly colored, beautiful nylon bags. They were installed in the Rockland Public Library for at least a couple of months. 
And at the end of the installation, they all came down and there was a day where the public could come in and get um, a bag to take home for free. Here's another image of the bags um, that were installed and hanging. Another project that I work with, with youth from students from the um, Lincolnville School through the Farnsworth Museum. Initiated, um, it initially started out with their collection of bottle caps. I went into the school and worked with the students to design and then eventually create uh, waves that were installed in the Farnsworth that had a plywood backing and bottle caps on the surface. So the students um, were actively participating in how it, the, uh, the piece would be designed in the background color, in the cutout shapes. They painted the back, um, they sanded the plywood, they glued on the bottle caps. And we all the while we had discussions about uh, the use of single use materials like plastic. In fact, on this particular day, we had a lunch break and I observed them all putting their lunch bags trash into the garbage can. And after we talked about how could we behave differently in that way, perhaps we would use um, bags that could be brought home and filled up again for tomorrow's lunch, or instead of using plastic, um, plastic ware for forks and knives and spoons, we could use a spork that's reusable instead of a plastic water bottle and tossing that in the trash at the end of the day, a reusable, water bottle. So it was um, a conversation that we had um, and a learning opportunity for them. This is the final piece which we were all really delighted uh, with and very proud of. And many of the, uh, the students came to the opening reception and um, uh, took a lot of pride in their work. I have been focusing on upcycling plastic uh, for quite a while now. And I had been looking at a website called Precious Plastic. Precious Plastic is um, a, a man, uh, David Hawkins, and I think he's in Norway, started this open source website where he, um, he shared blueprints, plans, designs, CAD designs, uh, where anyone could take the information and build their own recycling machines. So what you're seeing is a plastic shredder, an extruder, an injector, and a compression oven. And I looked at this website pretty obsessively for months and months and months and finally said, I just have to do this. I have to figure out a way to uh, build these machines or buy these machines. Um, one way or another, because I kept returning to this. So one of the things that has prompted this whole body of work, especially at this point, is that um, being conscientious about our overconsumption and all the things that we put in the trash, which end up in the landfill, I was feeling very hypocritical that I was using raw materials to create my art to create work. So I made a decision that coincidentally coincided with the beginning of the pandemic to not buy anything new and not throw anything away. So there are some exceptions, of course, like food and underwear. I mean, there's things that you just have to buy new, but to really minimize that and also to use as much of my own trash to create art as I can. I have a plastic bin in front of my house and I encourage the, my community to drop off plastic. I'm particularly interested in number two plastic, which is milk jugs, water jugs. It's the semi-transparent uh, whitish plastic that's quite common. And the reason I like that is because it's very easy to 
So one of the things I had to do is to really learn about what the properties of plastic um, different one through seven plastics are and which are the most compatible um, for my working process, which ones can I color, which ones are brittle, which ones have more flexibility, and I found that number two plastic is my favorite. After a Kickstarter campaign and a lot of uh, fundraising, I acquired these four plastic recycling machines, the ones that you just saw in the image earlier. I found that the ones that I use the most are the shredder and the extruder, but I will get to the compression oven and the injection um, machine soon. So I feel like I'm still learning how to use these machines and figuring out um, how I can create with them. There are many ways that one can produce practical objects, fill molds, make things that people can use that are functional. And I think that that's great, but I'm an artist and I make sculptural installations, did before I came to plastic and want to continue to do that with the plastic. This is the first sculptural installation that I created um, with the upcycled plastic. So there's a difference between recycled and upcycled. If I send a yogurt tub off to the transfer station and make sure it gets in the right recycling bin, then it will be, it'll go to EcoMain and it will get recycled, I hope. If I take the same yogurt tub and I shred it and I add some pigment to it and I extrude it, I have upcycled it. In other words, I've taken my own plastic and I've turned it into something that is another form that's functional or, or usable. So if you can imagine the plastic coming out of the extruder like toothpaste, colorful toothpaste, and it's warm and pliable, and I have gloves on because it's three to 400 degrees, I can manipulate it for about a minute. And after a minute goes by, it's no longer flexible. And that's the shape that I am going to live with. So each one of these uh, extruded pieces, I have a few, just grabbed a few here to show you. Each one of these extruded pieces has um, different color and has little nails in the end of it. There you can see maybe, so that I can um, push the plastic extrusions into the wall. This piece is an interactive kinetic sculpture. Each ball is a wound plastic coil around the um, door stopper springs that I've used in other pieces in the past. This piece is as wide as my arms can reach. And when someone stands in front of it and moves their arms up and down and up and down, all the balls do a little blah, 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 um, make a knocking sound and jiggle back and forth until they all come to a stop. So that is very interactive and very kinetic. Making Waves is my most recent uh, work that I actually have currently installed at the Colby Arts Collaborative. And this, um, this happened as a result of being invited to be a visiting artist through the summer where each Wednesday I would go to Colby and spend the day. And it was an open door policy where anyone off the street could come in and work with me to recycle, upcycle plastic. I also engaged this uh, community in um, brainstorming what we were going to create, what was it gonna look like, what color was it gonna be, what was it going to be named. So we collectively um, processed how many did I figure? 500 milk jugs. We figure uh, uh, about the equivalent of 500 milk jugs. So what I found is that there's a lot of cleaning and cutting and removal of the caps and cutting off the collars and cutting off the labels that happens 
um, before plastic can be recycled. So these um, folks are cutting plastic into, I always ask them to make it smaller than the palm of your hand so that I can fit it into the shredder. It's really important that everything that I work with is the same plastic, number two plastic, so it's not, I don't get a number five contaminating the bucket of number two. After the plastic pieces are cut, they go through the shredder and they come out looking like this, looks like plastic snow. It's actually microplastic. So that's exactly what we don't want ending up in our oceans and in our fish and eventually eating the fish and it ends up in us. So it's, that's why it's so vitally important to keep plastic out of the ocean. These uh, participants are also cleaning plastic. Uh, you can see an extruded piece coming out of the uh, extruder, that blue piece, and then coming towards the camera. Here are some extruded pieces. Um, we chose a palette of blues and teals and aquas, all wave colors because it is it was to be a wave each one you can see has a little nail in it and that uh, was so it could be attached to the wall and here's a, a bunch of different uh, wave extrusions so i worked with um, with my team on some of these extrusions and then i continued creating them when i came back to my studio as well and here is the finished piece so it winds from one wall, kind of jumps over a doorway. I'll show you another photo, goes up the ceiling and kind of meanders down and around and, and up. There's the whole piece. So this will be up for, actually don't have a deinstallation date. Um, it's, I'm sure that it's up for another month or two. We'll see. So I'm continuing to go back to Colby's Arts Collaborative and work with the community on uh, workshops where we upcycle a material into a product. So these, um, the bag that I'm holding is made of a coffee bean bag from Rock City Cafe. They are the roastery, I should say. They, knowing that I collect stuff like this, asked if I would be interested in uh, relieving them of a big pile of coffee bean bags, which I was more than happy to do. And then the sheets on the inside pillowcases uh, are fabric that I find at thrift shops like Goodwill. And then I have a collection to draw on. So my um, participants are all going to end up with a unique coffee bean bag um, that has a different inside and a different outside. Only two of the folks in the workshop of seven people have sewn. So I called on my mom, who's a fantastic seamstress, to accompany me as my assistant every, uh, this last week and tomorrow. We'll go and finish them up. So working with, um, with the community and doing hands-on projects and teaching um, people how to use tools and equipment and to um, upcycle materials that they may already have in their possession into something usable. I find um, that it's satisfying for me to share those skills, but it's also very satisfying for the participants to walk away with something that they made. So these are earrings that I created out of number six plastic. Number six plastic is the kind of thin clear plastic that might be on a cake, um, a sheet cake from a big grocery store. It's very thin and it's, there's usually a big flat part. Number six plastic, for those of you that um, grew up when I did, it's called shrinky dink and you used to be able to buy this stuff um, as a product, but it's really just number six plastic. It shrinks to about a third of the size. So something that starts off at about six inches in diameter ends up being a, roughly two inches in diameter. And you can use uh, Sharpies to color it. It's easy to cut um, and it makes cool, cool 
product products um, that are unique and creative. So not only do I work with um, adults and teens, um, but I work with youth with using uh, materials like this at the landing place. I've worked with, um, for the last year, I've worked with youth at a community center, Sakala in Haiti, and I work exclusively with those youth to upcycle plastic. They have such um, a waste problem that's clogging up the water streams and the canals. Uh, so we work together to create things that are chic and upcycled together. This is one of the products that we created together, which is a cool little, I have one within my reach here, which is a cool little triangle pouch. This is made out of plastic bags. All you need to do this is an iron and parchment paper. Um, so there's a lot of, actually an awful lot of things that can be made with just the materials that you see on the bottom right. We've made kites and wind socks and belts and visors and bags. It's pretty much endless. So it really just stiffens up when you apply heat over the parchment paper and you can layer and layer and cut and collage. It's a lot of fun. So this brings me to a current project, which is my pop up cycler. I have made a real commitment to working with um, with plastic and turning plastic trash into sculptural installations. But I've also made a real commitment to involving the community in this project. So this is a very small uh, rendition. I have my little model here. This is a, a, a scale model of what is becoming a pop-up cycler. So if you can imagine that this gets hitched to the back of my van. And when I go to a community to work with plastic, these um, workbenches pop down on both sides. And then my recycling machines are inside, as am I. And I work with um, the folks on the outside that are participating to process plastic. And then I turn um, the plastic into a sculptural installation and leave it behind. So the installation belongs to them. This was the beginning of the um, scaling up of the pop-up cycler just to make sure that my machines fit inside my triangle, which is obviously the recycling symbol and that will be painted on the outside. I just took some strapping and uh, kind of screwed it together real quick to make sure before I ordered my trailer that everything would fit. And here's my backyard and on the right, my workshop, small workshop where um, I've been working on the beginning stages of the um, pop-up cycler, my portable unit. And just to give you a sense of how big it is and how I can actually fit on the inside, I can actually sleep in it. I can lie down, it's a four by six trailer. So in a pinch, I can always, um, you know, park it and sleep, sleep in the back when I'm on the road. I have big ideas about uh, first traveling around Maine with the pop-up cycler and then expanding to New England. And then in a year or two, doing around the country um, trip, using my pop-up cycler to work with uh, communities all around the country. So here's some progress here. You can see what the fold down workbench is gonna look like. And a little further along, there's a hatch in the back that opens up so I can get in and out of it. That's on the right. And here's um, my choice of colors, which is a like a punchy teal color with an aqua on the inside. There's gonna be uh, some, maybe some red trim on the outside. So it's coming together. Um, I'm also working with my friend and collaborator, Rob Hart, who um, has since retired from Harvard in the physics department and together we're, we're, bu we're building a pedal shredder. So this will be a shredder for plastic 
Uh, I have a shredder and I plug it in and it shreds just fine, but I really want a manual shredder that I can take around in my pop-up cycler so I could have um, people of all ages shred the plastic manually and be really physically engaged in this project. So if you'd like to see more, I have lots more projects and images on my website at kimbernard.com. So I will stop sharing here and enlarge all of you. And I invite you to unmute and click your video so I can see you. And um, let's talk. <laughs> Tom. Yeah. So yes, I got excited when you were telling me about the uh, the work at with uh, University of New England and <laughs> and I, I'm bec partly because of her and of course, but also I when I've been involved when I lived down in the Pemaquid Peninsula with Ocean Cleanup Day, which is now Ocean Cleanup Month, yeah. and I was just wondering if yeah. if you've done products and you know collaboration with other groups for that partner for Ocean Cleanup Day. Not everything you get on those days you can recycle, but uh, with your machine, yeah. have you done something like that, or would you be interested in doing something? Uh, like that? I would be very interested in doing another project with Ocean Cleanup Month. I think it should be Ocean Cleanup Three Sixty Five. I know, really. Right, right, right. I mean, <laughs> but absolutely, I mean that was that was a really gratifying. Pro project for all of us. And I think we all learned a lot. And as, to my knowledge, the installation is still there. And my work study students created these um, very um, educational um, graphics and text that go along with the piece. So someone could look and see like how this piece came to be, who did it, where did it start, what was collected, when was it collected, and then some facts about um, the trash along the ocean, you know, yeah, um, yeah. ocean debris. Right. So, you know, it's, it's um, these projects are a great experience. It's creative, it's educational, it raises awareness. And, uh, and they're fun and they're beautiful. So the fun and beautiful is like right up there at the top of the list. Like I said, when I was describing that piece, it's colorful, it's bright, it's attractive, it draws people in. And only then do they realize that, oh, this is like beach trash. So I always want that to be second to pull them in first. Right. Much in the way that when I'm working with a student group or any type of group, um, the discussion about plastic and consumption and landfill and uh, waste happens as we're having fun creating and processing the materials. It's not uh, it's not a lecture and it's non-judgmental and people figure it out on their own. I really don't even have to say, you know, we really shouldn't be using this. We know this, right? So I, I let them come to that determination. But yes, to answer your question, I'd be, I would be happy to. Yeah. We'll squeeze you, We'll try to figure out how to squeeze you in be, uh, uh, between your on the road to our America. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Sounds good. I've got to get the electric vehicle or at least a hybrid first before I do the on the road thing. <laughs> Any other questions that you might have from the audience? Oh, so, I'm uh, curious. Caroline uh, <laughs> asked about, would you be interested in coming down to Portland High School? Yeah, so I quickly glanced at her. Um, it's hard for me to read the chat and talk to you. Yes. Sure. Yes. In fact, um, one of the other instructors, I'm not sure which high school it is, because I know there are several in Portland, Mark Ford asked if I would be interested in coming to Portland. And the answer is absolutely yes. I, I would be delighted to. 
I'm easy to find. I have a link from my website. It's info at kimbernard.com. So email me and um, yes, I would love to. Would the best thing be to email you and see if we can connect? That's, yeah, that's a really good way to be in touch is just send me an email and then we'll we'll go from there. I can send you information that you can share with your administration or other teachers if you'd like, just to tell them what what the project is, but yes. So Kim, uh, one question uh, from the audience was, what type of pigment do you use to create the different colors? So I use all different types of pigment and I, I am very versed in using pigments because I've worked a lot with encaustic and I've made my own encaustic paints. So encaustic is beeswax, damar, which is resin and pigment. So I already had pigments in my studio. So I was just dying to see if I could put pigment into plastic and would it color it and mix it in the same way that it does with encaustic and it does. It's really important to have adequate ventilation, to wear gloves, to protect your eyes, to wear a mask. Um, so I just have to be really careful when I use it not to let that pigment dust get around and airborne in my studio because it's, it's nasty stuff. Do you have a tentative timeline for launching the pop-up? And people, yeah, people already want to schedule you for draw stops like your county as well as <laughs> yeah i mean i've been holding off booking too much too soon because i really need to finish the pop-up cycler first but by the time it's cold which i would say is end of october it will be done and i'll be able to take it on the road i really can now but it's not buttoned up. It's not totally done. So, um, you know, it would make sense because it's an outdoor project to, um, I mean, I can take it in the winter, but to bring students out, to bring participants out, spring is really an ideal time. So get, a, you know, if we schedule everything and as soon as the warm weather hits, um, that's a really nice time to have me come and, um, do projects yeah, that's with assuming participants. You, that's assuming you stay in the Northeast, that you don't become world famous and go over <laughs> all over the globe. <laughs> Odds are good that I'm going to be right here. <laughs> so somebody asked, uh, Caroline asked uh, that they are looking to build, uh, looking at building a sculpture in the courtyard down at Portland High School. Uh, it would uh -huh. be outside. Are there different types of materials you'd steer us towards? Besides the re recycled plastic, which obviously would be. Yeah, is this, a, is this a percent for art project by any chance? No. no, okay. So yeah, for outdoor materials, well, plastic is fine, but it's not real durable, um, but wood, stone, metal, um, there are a lot of composite materials that are great for outdoors. So, you know, depending on who's gonna build it, what kind of facilities you have. The other, there are lots of considerations with public art, like safety, um, you know, if someone's climbing on it, can they get hurt? There's liability issues if someone does. So outdoor art has a lot of, uh, there are a lot of considerations that um, have nothing to do with the aesthetics and everything to do with it's, um, is it, will it weather well and will anyone get hurt on it or will it get stolen? So you mentioned the weather part. I'm wondering about some of the, uh, uh, you know, projects that you have with the recycled plastic and with different pigments, the, uh, you thinking most of those installations might be indoors as opposed to outdoors because of the uh, you know UV light just degrades the coloration yeah. of them. Yeah, and that that could happen. Like if I were to buy a plas red plastic Adirondack chair, you know the hundred percent plastic ones, they fade over a few years. But you know you'll be able to get a good five years out of it. And the beautiful thing is that 
I can take any sculpture that I've created and break it down again and shred it again and make something else. Yeah. So I can recycle my own work. It can go around several times. Have you done the calculations about the, uh, the energy cost to, uh, you know, the, the inputs and the outputs over, you know, the economics of it and how yeah. it's working that way? Like the, um, the extruder, for example, there's heat. I'm heating the plastic to between yeah. around 350. So it's well, the canal, the, you know, auger is very well insulated. Um, it's, you know, it's only a short span. Um, I have not, I have not read how much that's increasing my, um, you know, my electrical consumption. Yeah. But what I really want to do is to put some uh, solar panels, flexible solar panels, like you'd see on a boat, on my uh, pop-up cycler. So I'll I'll be collecting solar energy and using. I'm not sure if that's going to work. I'm not sure how much I I'm going to need to require if I need to store. Um, but I'm going to give it a give it a try. The, the manual shredder will allow us to use human energy. Right. And just get a little exercise at the same point. Yeah. So well, I've been involved with uh, some outdoor and, you know, educational interpretive signage before. And this one company up in Canada makes this amazing, you know, waysides that are, you can make interactive and have a small solar panel, but it's not, it wouldn't generate enough electricity for something that you're talking about. Right. It's, just, it's enough for like buttons and stuff. But the most popular feature they have is just like your pedals thing. They have a uh, hand crank generator for uh, the electricity to run the exhibit in yeah. the, out in the field. So everybody gets sort of like involved with watching the exhibit. So I love, I love, somebody else made the comment, the cycle thing just really gets people involved, you know, and I've seen it up at the common ground fair. Somebody has always like, I know pedal. I can't remember actually what you're doing. Like you're shredding something or, I get something or right. crushing something for fruit or vegetables. But anyway, that interactive part makes people remember it too. Right. Absolutely. If they've, if they've shredded, they're not going to forget. Yeah. The more off the grid this can be and the more interactive and participatory, the better. Yeah. 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 Are there any other questions that folks have? All righty. Well, Kim, I, we cannot thank you enough for sharing this presentation with us this evening. And we'll definitely be in touch uh, about getting you come down to Heron Gut and do some community event, perhaps in time with Ocean Cleanup Day, maybe with a, a college or a university that be something collaborative also, sure. as well as the local school. So yeah, that'd be great. So much. And, yeah, yeah. And for, uh, you know, for those of you that asked about your high school or school in, in general or have an art center in mind, you know, I'm more than happy to do um, a Zoom artist talk with students uh, like the Environmental Club in Portland. That sounds like a, you know, a really great first start when students get to like do a little show and tell. I pull things, you know, I'm pulling things out of my studio and saying, oh, this and do a little demo. And that's really a nice way to engage um, people as a first step. So that's always something that I'm happy to do. Great. Good.